Have you ever accused God? Uh, My name is Eric Nielsen. I'm the pastor of a new church in Twin Falls called High Plains Christian Church. And uh, we are considering that question today in Romans chapter 8. Before we get into that, I'd like to just remind you that September 13th, we're having our very first church service. Uh, We're going to be at the Hilton Garden Inn uh, in the Conference Center at 10 a.m. And we'd love to have you. This is kind of our actual, our our first test drive service. And so we're not sure how it's going to go, but man, we're going for it. And we'd love you to come and join us. Uh, We have to wear a mask. We're renting the space and the hotel policy right now is a mask. So uh, put on a mask. Come on out. I don't want to hear this like, it's infringing on my freedom. Look, it's one hour. You can do it. It's for Jesus. He died on the cross. What are you whining about? All right. Come on out, 10 o'clock, September 13th, love to see you. I hear people accuse God all the time, and it kind of bothers me. Like, I don't need to defend God. He doesn't need me to defend Him. But when people accuse God, I just think, man, who the heck do we think we are, right? They say stuff like this, why did God allow this to happen? Uh, Why didn't God stop that? Uh, Why did God uh, not give me what I wanted? If God is so good, then fill in the blank. Uh, People accuse God all the time, and they do it pretty casually. If you've ever been to court, like on jury duty or maybe for some other reason, uh, you you realize there's not a lot of places in our modern world where someone has absolute authority. You feel it when you walk into the courtroom. The judge walks in, and and they say, please stand, and no one just sits there. Uh, Everybody has to stand up and nobody gets to sit back down until the judge sits back down. And if you have a question, you can't just blurt it out. Uh, You you have to raise your hand and like ask permission uh, to talk. Uh, Even lawyers who are supposed to be there, they have to wait their turn. And and judges can tell lawyers they aren't allowed to say certain things or ask certain things. And if you break the rules in court, the judge has the power to fine you money or even throw you in jail, have you arrested. You don't mess with the judge. I mean, even knuckleheads know that, right? So imagine if someone in the courtroom was there and and they decide that they were going to stand up and bring charges against the judge. I mean, how would that end, right? It'd probably be some big bailiff would cuff them and stuff them because you just don't accuse a judge. And if you do, you don't do it lightly. Uh, The last person who dare bring charges against a judge is who? A guilty person. And yet that's what guilty people do all the time to God. People act as though they are the judge and God is on trial. Uh, They accuse him, put him on trial all the time for various things. And the number one charge against our God, at least that I hear, is in regard to God's number one characteristic. People say uh, that God is not loving. It's amazing to people, to me, that people uh, charge him with being unloving as if they are the standard of what real love looks like. And so as we're looking at Romans 8, actually wrapping up an eight-week series in this power-packed passage, uh, we're looking at the question about God's love. So here's our text, uh, starting in verse 35. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute, or in danger, or threatened with death. As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day, we are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, an overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow, I mean that is a passage Now, there's a context I want to point out right out of the gate about God's love. Uh, I believe, first of all, that God loves everyone. 
And we know what John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, there's a general sense in which God loves everyone. God loves the world. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.4 says, God wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. He's not rooting against anybody. He actually wants everybody to understand the truth and to be saved. 2 Peter 3.9 says, God doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. His desire is that no one goes to hell, but that we come around and walk in the way of repentance. So it's accurate to say that God uh, loves all of us, that he's for us. We talked about that last week. Uh, he desires for everyone to be saved, but not everyone will be saved. So the context thing, in our passage, Paul keeps using the word us repeatedly, and a couple times the word we. So who's he talking about? Well, he's talking to Jesus' followers. He's already said in verse 28 that God is working things together for the good the ultimate good, we talked about this last week, of those who love God. Uh, he asks, uh, this passage encourages those who already know Jesus. It's, it's the us, the family of God, the body of Christ. And he asks this people, or I'm sorry, he asks this question that people today are still asking. Uh, and I, I love this. He's, it's the question of God's love. The Bible is timeless in its relevance. Uh, people from all over the world, throughout points in history have related to the words that we just read. Uh, does it mean, here's the question people are asking, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? Um, and that's exactly what people are asking. Something horrible happens and they say, well, if God's real, then why did this happen? Or if God's so loving, then why did would this happen? And could I just point out that Christians and non-Christians both ask those kinds of questions. These are exhibits A, B, and C in the case against God's love. Now, what about the trouble in the world? What about hunger? What about the poor and the destitute? And what about death and dying in, in the world? And aren't all of these the proof that God is not a God of love? I'm going to kind of hit pause there on Romans 8 and kind of flip over to Luke 15, another familiar passage uh, about the story of a father who had two sons. One of the sons, the younger son, uh, said, Dad, even though you're not dead yet, can I have my inheritance now? And for some reason, the father didn't smack him and say, get back to work. Um, the father said, okay, uh, I'll do it. And so he divided his inheritance between his two sons. Uh, the son didn't have any money. The father had worked and succeeded and acquired wealth. Pretty bold request. Um, the father had to probably suspect what would happen if he gave this younger son his share of the inheritance. But for whatever reason, in the story, he says yes. And you know what happened. We call him the prodigal son. He went off. He took all the money and he wasted it on whiskey and women and wild living. And, and then he was broke. And he had no job and no money and nowhere to turn. Um, he had no one to turn to. He got a, a job slopping the hogs and he was so hungry he thought about eating the hog slop. And in the pit of despair, he came to his senses and he said, you know, things weren't like this back home. Uh, my father loved me. He provided for me. But I've ruined that. I'm a disgrace. I'm a failure. I'm a dis disappointment. He, and so he hatched this plan in his mind. He said, I'm going to go and see if my father will at least take me on as a hired hand, as a servant. Um, he couldn't possibly want me back as a son. But maybe he'll give me table scraps, you know. And so it says that he was, when he was still a long way off, the father saw him. And I, I get the idea that the father always had one eye on the horizon looking for that wayward son to come back. And when he saw him, he didn't wait for him to come up and, and grovel. He, he actually ran to his son and he embraced him and he kissed him. And, and this son started this little speech he'd worked up about just being a servant. And the father said, nonsense. Uh, get some clean clothes and new shoes for my son and put a ring on his finger and fire up the barbecue and and they welcomed him home and then he says this in Luke 15 24 this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life 
he was lost, but now he's found. Love that story. You got to love that story. How did the father feel about the son? He loved him. Uh, why did the father let the son leave? He loved him. How did he feel about the son when he was rebelling? Still loved him. Uh, how did he feel about his son when he was suffering? He loved him. And why did he take him back after all the stupid stuff he did? Because the father loved him. What drove the son back to the father? Suffering. Verse 35 says, again, does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we're being killed every day. Verse 37, I want to read it in the NIV. It says, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. That's how I learned it when I was a kid. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The trouble that God allows isn't intended to drive us away from him. It's meant to drive us into his arms. And that's true for all people. And we look at it all wrong. People say, what kind of sadistic and narcissistic God would allow us to have problems so that we'll turn back to him? Like God allows trouble so that we'll need him somehow. And that's the wrong way of looking at it. I would say that sometimes God allows trouble so that we'll remember we always need him. You see the difference? It's not that God causes trouble so we have this moment where we go, I guess I need God, I should go back. No, no, no. The suffering in this world, and people debate all day long whether God causes it or allows it, but the, the function it serves is to remind us that we always desperately need God every single day. That we remember that he's not uh, something we need in our life, that he is our life. We live in this fallen world, a world completely corrupted by sin. And it's not like oh, those bad people sin and they screw up everything and we all suffer. No, no, no. The Bible says all of us sin. It's our sin that corrupts the world. It's your sin. It's my sin. This world is not how God wants it to be. There's trouble. There's hardship, even for God's people. And that leads some people to understandably ask, how can God say he loves us when there's all this pain and suffering in our world? And you know what? If the prodigal had thought that way, he'd still be sitting in the hog pen instead of in the father's arms. And many people are doing just that. God created people in, and because of his great love, <coughs> excuse me, he gave us freedom because of his great love. He had to know what would happen, what we would do with that freedom. And he loved us even when we sinned against him. In fact, he even made a way for us to come back to him through Jesus Christ. And I believe that God, like the father in the story, always has one eye on the horizon looking for lost sons and lost daughters. And not so he can zap them, not so he can lecture them or ridicule them or turn them into some slave, but so that he can welcome them back with open and loving arms. Why? Because he's loved them. He's always loved them and nothing they can do will make him stop loving them. Maybe that's you. Maybe you're the one that's far from God. And today you're hearing this message that God loves you and wants you and wants you back into his family. You know, if God was put on trial for being unloving, he'd be found not guilty. People don't usually question God's love because they find him unloving they usually question God's love because they are self-righteous and rebellious. They're prodigals. And just like the prodigal in Luke 15, they want to, to take whatever the Father will give them. Man, I want to be forgiven. I want to go to heaven. I want all the, the good stuff that God could possibly give me. And when they, they feel like they've got it, they often run. You know, Pop up your hand at the revival, say some prayer when, when everyone's got their eyes closed, feel good about yourself, and then go off and do whatever the heck you want. That's not following Jesus. I want to say this, and I, I know it's going to sound harsh, but I think those who, are, who usually question God's love are the people who have no love for God. 
They really have no interest in knowing him. They really have no uh, care about what he says. They don't think they even really need him. They struggle to even believe in him. They owe God everything, just like me and everybody else, but they show him no love. He owes us absolutely nothing. Do you ever think about that? God doesn't owe you a thing. And yet he loves you with an unconditional and unwavering and everlasting love. And so people who question God's love are usually looking for a a reason, I think. They're looking for a reason, to an excuse to write him off or to not believe in him at all. And because he loves those people, he lets them go. Go back and read Romans 1. It talks about God handing people over to their own desires and pursuits and their own sin. He lets them go the way they want and and let them see how that works. And even then, when he hands people over to their sin, I think it's because he wants them to to be miserable and, and realize that there's a better way and it's his way. But for those who know the Son of God, the us that the passage is referring to, For those who know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, we have experienced the love of God firsthand. And in light of all we know from life experience, Romans 8 and the whole Bible, we find that the evidence overwhelmingly supports our God as being a God of love. And to recap that last part, I'm convinced, he says, that nothing can ever Nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons. There's nothing in the physical world, nothing in the spiritual world. Neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. They can't Satan and all of his demons can't possibly drive a wedge between us and God or or take us out of God's love. No power, he says, in the sky above, that's the, the heavenly realms, or in the earth below where we live. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's the ultimate proof of God's love that he sent his one and only Son so that sinners... I mean sinners, rebels, prodigals, anyone who believes in Jesus Christ and receives him as their their Savior and their Lord, anyone can be forgiven. Anyone can be heaven-bound. Anyone can get a new lease on life, what Jesus called an abundant life, by following in the footsteps of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And that's the ultimate expression of his love, that he would take people who have have mocked him and ridiculed him and abandoned him and betrayed him and sinned against him and rebelled against him and and done everything he said not to do, people that have thumbed their nose at God and acted as if they were the Lord of their own little lives, people that have done all that, God still loves them. People who have lived, the Bible says, as enemies of the cross of Christ are invited to become the family of God. So after reading this passage... I think we all know what we mean to God. He loves us. The real question is, what does God mean to you? And so we'll wrap up today with kind of a a Facebook invitation. Man, if you don't know God as your uh, God, Jesus as your Savior, if you don't have the Holy Spirit of God living in you, which we started talking about in the beginning of Romans 8, uh, I would love to talk with you about what that means. You can give me a call or a text at 208-410-8655. If you're interested in rededicating your life, maybe you've known God, but you're that prodigal that's been wandering and it's time to come back. I'd love to talk with you about that. Uh, So reach out to me. Uh, If you're interested in High Plains Christian Church, have questions about our service, about what our church believes, anything like that, you can go on to our website. It's just highplains.cc. Or again, you can just reach out to me at 208-410-8655. I'd be happy to have a conversation with you, answer your questions, buy you a cup of coffee. Uh, Next week at the uh, Twin Falls County Fair, we're going to have a booth. I've been told that we're being put right next to the elephant ears. Um, So that's, I mean, awesome. Um, And I'm going to be in that booth all week. So uh, if you want to have a conversation, come find me. Uh, I'd love to get your name, get to know you, hear your story. And we'll be out there at the fair again, September 13th, 10 a.m. 
Hilton Garden Hotel. Hope we can make it. Hope you can make it. And uh, we'll see you then.